In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Truly, He is risen. We hear a very familiar and powerful story in a Samaritan woman's life. This is one of the longest one on one interactions in all the gospel text. And in dealing with the Samaritan woman, patiently, our Lord gives us a foretaste, if you will, of the way that he would unite the, the Jews and the Gentiles through his work. And he would reconcile the Gentiles back to a, a living relationship with God. Our Lord comes to sit near the, the well of Jacob, the Jacob's well, and we're told that he was tired from his journey. And he saw the Samaritan woman at the well, and he did something completely unexpected. He broke the social conventions and the ritual laws of purity by speaking to her. He asked her for a cup of water. What a simple act. What a simple request. And in demonstrating some need, he was actually opening her up. He was reeling her in for the conversation that would ultimately change her life. Since our Lord is our model for our life, we might do well to learn from this interaction and this example. Sometimes we have to appear vulnerable. We have to appear needy in order for others to get close to us. And through this, we may be able to help them come to a living knowledge of God. It's a sign of humility. And in humbling himself, Christ asked her for help. The Lord Actually, he, he draws her in. He doesn't really need her help. He can absolutely handle the bucket of water and the well without her assistance. But he chooses to humble himself in order to give her an opportunity to be blessed. This is what, this is what happens in the church when we ask for service. It's an opportunity for the individual servant to be blessed. God doesn't need me. He doesn't need Daniel. He doesn't need this guy. He can work his miracles without me. But he uses me for me to be blessed. It's like, I'm, I'm reminded of an example that Archie Mark uses uh, to illustrate this a little bit better. He says, have you ever put together one of those Ikea furniture sets? And if you ever have, if you have little kids around the house, they always want to help. When they see the boxes being opened up and things like that, how can they help Daddy? How can they help? I don't really need their help, right? In fact, they would... It would actually make things a little bit longer, but sure, I'll give them the screwdriver and they can start turning it. And, and so it's for them to be blessed. So this is what our Lord does with us. He gives us an opportunity to be blessed. He uses us in that way. And so the woman at the well, whom we later know to be the name St. Fotini, uh, did not understand what our Lord was doing, but only looked at the social conventions and the laws of the day. She replied to him, how is that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? And our Lord answered her with these lovely words. He says, if you knew the gift of God, and who is it that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water. The Samaritan woman is still clearly confused. She's thinking about physical, material water. But our Lord is offering her something that is divine, something that is spiritual. So after she questions our Lord again, he replies, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst forever. And whatever, and, and the water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What is the water that our Lord is speaking about? What is this water that allows us to never thirst again and become in each one of us a spring that leads to eternal life? Of course, this is the Holy Spirit. St. Cyril says, Jesus calls the quickening gift of the Spirit living water because mere human nature is parched to its very roots, now rendered dry and barren of all virtue by the crimes of the devil. But now human nature runs back to its pristine beauty and drinking in that which is life-giving. It is made beautiful with a variety of good things and budding into a virtuous life. It sends out healthy shoots of love towards God. So it becomes clear to us that the Lord has specifically come to heal this woman 
and to give her life. He can see and he knows her thirst for God. In fact, he saw her failed marriages and her divorces and a woman who is ultimately searching desperately for love. Oftentimes, our sins can be traced directly to an inner sense of feeling unloved. When a, when a person falls into drug addiction or alcohol abuse, it's often because they are trying to self-soothe. It's because he doesn't sense love, so he turns to something that, that numbs pain or fills emptiness. When a person doesn't feel attention or love, they often look left and right, and they try to find someone or anything that will try to give them attention. She is so thirsty for a deep love that sadly she will almost throw herself to anyone to try to quench that thirst. No matter how destructive the situation is, no matter how toxic the individual that she meets, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, our Lord says. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to a thirsty and a weary Samaritan woman in today's gospel. A woman who is indeed thirsty for water, but the Lord found her to be thirsty for much more than water. She was lonely. She loved companionship. She needed to have a man around her at all times. She needed to feel love and attention. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. These words should come alive for each one of us. Water is the most important thing that a human being can consume. And yet afterward, we still need that water again and again and again. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. The Lord makes these words meaningful because we understand that he's not speaking about H2O, right? He's speaking about the desires and the thirst of our hearts. We are continually searching for something that makes us happy. This is the society that we live in now. We are constantly trying to find things that will bring us happiness or peace. How does a person become an alcoholic, for example? They're curious to see what one drink can do. And after this drink, they find that they feel a sense of peace or numbness that satisfies them for a few moments. The next time, they try to get that sensation again. They start drinking but adds more quickly to the mix and more and more in their body and their mind they develop a tolerance and they need to find that same feeling again they have to search for that feeling again so they add more to the mix finally their thirst is so strong that they can't quench it even if they were swimming in a pool of that strong drink it wouldn't satisfy them why because we are hardwired for something greater. We are hardwired for the infinite. No matter what we do, we find very few things that can actually permanently fulfill us. Some try drinks. Some try excessive dating. Some try wealth, gambling, playing with money. Others try careers and they get fully invested in their careers, investments. But in each one of these cases, our Lord tells us, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But our Lord continues, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst forever. The water that I shall give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The Lord tells us that He alone can quench our thirst. He alone can provide fulfillment. And this fulfillment is not conditional. It remains with us through thick and thin, through good times and really, really challenging times, through sickness, through tragedy, even death. He is our living water. No matter what deserts you travel in life, you can find fresh water in your well. So where is this well? 
It's in our hearts, in each one of us. We fill it regularly with all sorts of things, but this type of water evaporates. It never stays long, but whatever our Lord gives us, it remains forever. We're reading in a book with the high school group and the college group on the Fridays, uh, Practical Spirituality. And the author reminds us to have scripture in chapter 1, to have scripture or our Lord's words implanted in our hearts. We were talking about this at length. To read his words daily in the Gospels and other books of scripture, we have to think on them. We have to memorize them. And then they will stay in our hearts. We can pray fervently daily and develop a good relationship with God when we implant his word in our hearts. We can learn to weep. We can learn to shed tears while we ask for forgiveness in the well of our hearts. And this water is permanent when we implant the word in our hearts. It never fades, and it completely cleans, and it transforms whatever it touches. The human heart is a great puzzle, and some people try to spend their whole lives trying to arrange and to fill in the missing pieces. But again, we are hardwired for the infinite. There is a God-shaped hole in the heart of every man and woman and child. And the sooner in life that we learn to pursue God, the sooner that we find peace, and the sooner that we find fulfillment and purpose and holiness, the sooner that we find the living water, and the more that we can share this water with others. God can be captured in the heart that thirsts for him. It's not a passive experience, Christianity. Yet, we see good news in all of this, that we are loved. We are created for more than empty addictions. We were created for more than endless hunger and endless thirst. Christ has created us and give us a tremendous, deep hunger so that nothing created could ever fill this void. So that we would desire to be filled by the infinite, by the infinite love of God. St. John Chrysostom says that the Lord calls the Holy Spirit water in order to highlight the cleansing it does and the great refreshment it provides those minds that receive it. He offered her something precious, something that she frankly didn't deserve. I don't deserve it. The fathers understand that the Samaritan woman is a symbol of the church. She symbolizes each one of us. Christ comes to her, and he comes to each one of us and offers us what he offered her many years ago. And his promise still remains today. We know that she was thirsty for the Spirit of God. And we can see this from her actions after her encounter. The life that she lived. What about each one of us? We have to ask ourselves difficult questions. After Lent, after Holy Week, after the Feast of the Resurrection, what about each one of us? This encounter. Does our lives demonstrate the thirst for the Holy Spirit? Does it demonstrate a hunger for the will of God? Or does it demonstrate a hunger for my will? And you have to ask yourselves these questions. He gives us according, according to our own desire. But the deeper you go, the more he will share himself and his Holy Spirit. So what are we thirsty for? What are we hungry for? To what or to whom are we dedicating our lives to? If the Lord encountered one of us at the well, what conversation would he have with me? And how would we respond to him in return? Will we be offended? He's calling us out. He's airing my dirty laundry. What, who can hear me? Who can hear what's going on here? Would we argue? Would we run away as so many did? Or would we follow him for the rest of our lives? 
we can live this encounter through our time of quiet prayer, spiritual readings, our conversations with our Father Confession. A conversation is happening between our prayers and our reading of the Scripture, especially the Gospels, and the conversation that we have with our Father Confession. This is one conversation that's happening. And through our daily conversation and prayer comes our daily conversion. Sometimes this comes easily, but sometimes it requires us to struggle a little bit. God knows this, and he will bless our struggles to search him out with a pure heart. In a few weeks, we celebrate the great feast of Pentecost. I don't know if what you think of this feast, if it's an event of the past that we just remember it, or it's something that is happening daily, and we, we give it significance on a particular day. It's an event of the present, the Feast of the Pentecost. The Holy Spirit desires to fill you with his grace and to recharge you and to give you power to walk and to live according to the image and likeness of God. What is needed from us is to direct our thirst to the right place. If we keep chasing empty, abandoned wells, we should not be surprised that we're left in a worse shape than before we found them. Let us run to the well of our salvation, to our Lord Jesus Christ, who alone can bring us into fulfillment and love of the Holy Trinity. Cast away other bitter water that have stolen your, away your joy and your attention and turn to the one who gives sweet living water. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Then...